Hello, I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and this is going to be part one of the STEMI series, uh, Ischemia, Injury, and Infarct, uh, of the 12 lead electrocardiography course. So, if once again we review our six step method for 12 lead ECG interpretation, uh, you have, you know, rate and rhythm uh, axis determination, you're going to identify your intervals, your morphology your different STE mimics, and then finally, you're going to try to interpret the 12 lead for any presence of ischemia, injury, or infarct. Let's quickly define STEMI. STEMI uh, stands for ST Segment Elevated Myocardial Infarction. It is a diagnosis made with a 12 lead ECG. Um, it's not uh, you know, like getting your troponins or performing a, a cardiac catheterization, making a diagnosis that way. Uh, this diagnosis relies solely on the 12 EKG, a, a STEMI, right? And uh, based on that, they would then move on to those other things. You would draw your cardiac enzymes and uh, send the patient for percutaneous inter coronary intervention. Your, your typical STEMI criteria is something like the... Uh, you see here where it says ST segment elevation of greater than one millimeter in two contiguous leads and uh, the more uh, advanced criteria includes something like uh, in V2 and V3 you could have uh, ST segment elevation uh, under two millimeters so if it's two millimeters or more then it's more significant and that's what you would need for that STEMI criteria and the reason being is there's a normal variation of uh, ST elevation in a lot of people uh, in those V2 and, and V3 leads where the J point is more diffuse. The smaller the QRS complex, the more significant minimal ST elevation is. Remember, uh, ST elevation is, you know, uh, proportionate, so to speak, to the size of the QRS complex. So if you were to have a very small or, or low voltage QRS complex uh, with just one millimeter of elevation, that could be much more significant, and we may have some examples of that in this course. So, of course, we should probably review what contiguous leads are if our STEMI criteria requires that you have one millimeter of ST elevation in two or more contiguous leads. Contiguous leads are those that look at the same area of the heart, so uh, leads two, three, and AVF. Everything that's the same color here, obviously, uh, one and AVL are the high lateral leads. V5 and V6 are your low lateral leads, but V5 and V6 can be considered contiguous to leads 1 and AVL. Uh, V1 and V2, your septal leads are contiguous. V3 and V4 are contiguous. They're both your anterior leads. And then V5 and V6, as I said before, are your low lateral leads. However, also you get in the precordial uh, leads, which are these V leads, you could also say that V2 and V3 are contiguous, as well as V4 and V5. And it makes sense, right? Because where we put those precordial electrodes on the chest, they're not far from each other. They look at a very uh, close portion of the heart. And that's what we're trying to identify here is the different areas of the heart that are affected by ischemia, injury, or infarct. Some people may have heard of the phrase, I see all leads, to remember uh, all your different areas of the heart that these leads look at. Uh, I see all leads, I for inferior, the S in the word C for septal, the A in the word all for anterior, and then the L in the word leads for lateral. So that's a nice simple way to remember your different areas of the heart. When uh, and, and take a 12 lead, if you haven't done this before, take a 12 lead tracing that you may have, and actually write these areas uh, that it's looking at on the 12 lead itself. You'll notice AVR is kind of left uh, by itself, you know, all by its lonesome here. Uh, AVR doesn't really look at a particular part of the heart that's very useful when identifying STEMI. It's kind of out there in no man's land. It's got a pretty strange point of view. However, uh, it is going to be a similar point of view to V1, but, you know, not exactly the same. And it's often, uh, you know, left unchecked, so to speak. It gets no respect, in the words of Rodney Dangerfield and Dr. Amo Matu that first made that connection. However, you can use AVR for some of the uh, STEMI equivalents, and we may talk about that later on in this lecture. 
So it's important to understand your coronary circulation because this is where the heart receives all of its oxygenated blood flow. So the heart cannot make energy um, and be effective without good coronary circulation. And subsequently, if the heart is not receiving energy, the rest of the body won't receive energy, right? Because the heart is the pump for the entire body. Um, so the way that the heart receives its uh, oxygenated blood is through these coronary arteries that branch off the base of the aorta, okay? So right after the aortic semilunar valve, when that closes during diastole, the blood flow will enter these coronary arteries through their ostea, okay? Um, it'll go down here to the left or over here to the right. And this right coronary artery, as you can see, sits in this what's called the coronary sulcus between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The left main coronary artery is pretty short. Uh, you see it there behind the pulmonary trunk. And then it bifurcates into the left anterior descending and this left circumflex here. So th going back to the right coronary artery, the right coronary artery has a marginal branch that comes down here, provides blood flow to the right ventricle and the inferior wall of the heart. It will then wrap around the heart, and in about 85% of people, 85% of people, the right coronary artery is what we call a dominant RCA, and it provides blood flow to the posterior descending artery, or the PDA. The other 15% of people uh, may get their blood flow from a dominant left circumflex, which is this one right here which may wrap around and connect to the posterior descending artery. Again, that's about 15% of people. They have a dominant left circumflex. That's what that, that's called. Whichever side uh, provides blood flow to the posterior descending artery gets that word dominant. And, and in a very small amount of people, a very small percentage, there's actually what we call an anastomosis, where the two sides will connect in the back, and they get blood flow from both a RCA and a uh, left circumflex. And that's probably the best option, right? Because that way, if you happen to have an RCA occlusion, your left circumflex will hopefully provide that, uh, you know, backup system and blood flow over there. Your left anterior descending artery is a pretty important one. It comes down the septal wall here, and then branches uh, will then provide blood flow to the entire left ventricle. Uh, that left anterior descending artery, uh, often called the widowmaker, if occluded, uh, again, the left ventricle dominates pretty much everything the heart does because it, it, it's so thick, it dominates the electrical view, and uh, it, it provides blood flow to the entire body. Uh, the left, left ventricle, if, become, if it becomes infarcted, uh, you can uh, die rather quickly. So a lot of these LAD occlusions end up going into a uh, cardiac arrest r relatively quickly. That left circumflex that comes off of the left main as well, that provides blood flow to most of the lateral wall. This is called the lateral wall over here. Uh, let's erase some of this, and I'll kind of show you all that. This side's called the lateral wall, where the left circumflex is. That's the left ventricle, the lateral wall. The inferior wall, of course, is most of your right ventricle. Uh, because the heart doesn't sit up and down like this, right? It sits kind of tilted. If you were to take the heart and kind of tilt it this way a little bit, that's how it sits. And the apex kind of points out that way. So again, we should review the different areas of the heart that each coronary artery provides blood flow to. The right coronary artery, and this is going to be uh, as a standard in most people, right? N nothing is universal when it comes to physiology. However, uh, you know, there are norms. So this would be your norms. Right atrium, uh, the inferior wall, the inferior right ventricle, and the posterior wall, as I said before, in 85% of people uh, get blood flow from the RCA or the right coronary artery. Your left circumflex provides blood flow to the inferior wall to a much lesser degree. The isolated uh, right ventricle, posterior wall in about 15% of the population, anterior lateral wall, inferior lateral wall, and posterior lateral wall. So as you can see, the left circumflex uh, really does dominate the lateral circulation. And then your left anterior descending provides blood flow uh, to the anterior wall, the anterior septal wall, and the anterior septal lateral uh, wall as well. It's nicknamed the Widowmaker, as I said before. Um, and I'm not mentioning the left main before before the bifurcation. So these two uh, come off of that left main, which is the LMCA, the left main coronary artery. And if that were to become occluded, death is pretty imminent. Uh, you, you could also develop something called three-vessel disease where uh, 
uh, all of your main coronary arteries are affected as well. Um, in a lot of these occlusions, they're not 100% occlusions. They're 80% stenosis, 90%, so on and so forth. When you get that 100%, you, that's where you get complete lack of blood flow uh, to the distal areas. So how does an acute myocardial infarction occur? Well, people have uh, uh, some degree of coronary artery disease. They have this uh, atherosclerotic plaque buildup inside their coronary artery, uh, you know, from fatty deposits and cholesterol buildup. And this plaque has a hard shell on the top, and that cap kind of, you know, keeps all of that stuff there. And they'll develop what, you know, what's called stenosis, where they can have angina. Uh, if this heart that has this pretty severe coronary artery disease, if, if somebody were to exercise or have any reason for an increased oxygen demand, then they're not going to get enough blood flow to that tissue that this coronary artery supplies blood flow to. And then they'll start experiencing pain called angina pectoris, which they treat with nitroglycerin, right? So they might take nitro at home, and then that provides a dilation, both of this coronary artery and the surrounding coronary arteries, because you get what's called collateral blood flow from other coronary arteries. And um, that then the pain should go away. If the pain doesn't go away, and, and they have a sustained angina for you know, repeated doses of nitro, that's called unstable angina when it does not respond to treatment. So going back to your MI, when this uh, plaque breaks off, the cap of that plaque breaks off, the body does what the body does, right? So when it sees a, something is damaged, it tries to clot, and it sends thrombin and f fibrin to this area, developing a thrombus, right? Developing a thrombus or blood clot, uh, which will then impede blood flow distally. And that's when the patient's experiencing an acute myocardial infarction. So there are platelets in there. So obviously antiplatelet therapy um, and, and uh, you know, your platelet aggregate inhibitors such as aspirin are very helpful in this situation from keeping the clot from getting bigger. It's not going to break the clot or dissolve the clot, but it, it should keep it from getting any larger. Nitro is also very helpful in this situation. Even if nitro doesn't dilate this, this coronary artery enough to bypass that blood clot, it will uh, dilate all of the other coronary arteries enough to pro hopefully provide some collateral blood flow. So nitrates are important here as well. But uh, ultimately, this patient needs to be stented or uh, thrombolyzed or that clot needs to be retrieved. We talked briefly about the different areas of the heart and how the 12 lead views the different uh, areas of the heart. Remember, I see all leads. And this is what we're talking about. Again, you have your inferior wall here. You have your anterior wall, which is kind of, you're mostly talking about the left ventricle is your anterior wall. Uh, your lateral wall, again, that's mostly the left side of the heart. And then your septal wall, which of course is in between both the right and the left ventricle. And when you're talking about these areas of the heart, we're talking about the ventricles specifically. So you see here your right atrium's up here and your left atrium's up here. And if, of course, if the, you know, that coronary artery that provides blood flow to the atria, uh, e each atrium independently, becomes blocked. You will have ischemia injury and infarct to those areas, uh, but we're talking specifically about STEMIs, which are when we're talking about ventricular infarction. So to a lesser degree, the atria will be involved, uh, but to a much greater degree, and of course with, with uh, much more dire consequences, the ventricles will be involved. You got to review your heart anatomy in the in the different layers of the heart. You have your endocardium, which is your innermost layer, and then in between the endocardium and the epicardium, this is your epicardium out here, is this thick layer called the myocardium, and we call it a myocardial infarction because again the myocardium kind of uh, dominates the mass of the wall, and the way that these occur is you'll get the most distal area that uh, supplied blood flow from that coronary artery will first become infarcted. So that, in this case, would be endocardium, right? So you'll have, like, endocardial ischemia, and then that will become infarcted. And then the area around that will develop some injury. The area around that will develop some ischemia, okay? Ischemia is when they're hungry for oxygen, Injury is when they start having damage due to that uh, hypoxia or the anoxia. And then 
uh, infarctions when they have necrosis or irreversible damage from the uh, hypoxic event or the ischemic event, if you will. So here's a picture kind of showing the same thing that I was trying to explain. Um, and as this uh, infarction becomes worse, the zone of infarction will enlarge, uh, and then so will the injury around it, and so will the ischemia around that. So it's not in a steady state. And once the infarction reach, reaches the uh, you know epicardial layer, we call that a transmural infarction. And that would be the bat, the worst kind, right? Uh, when the infarction goes all the way from the endocardium to the epicardium, it's transmural. So you can't have a STEMI lecture without uh, defining what ST elevation is. So with ST elevation, we're talking about the ST segment, which, of course, is between the QRS complex and the beginning of the T wave. And specifically, we're looking around this J-point area. Uh, the J-point is the change of direction from the QRS complex into the ST segment. And then about one small box after that is where you should truly identify your ST segment elevation. But what do you compare it to? Uh, because most people, they'll often compare the ST segment to the, the PR segment, which isn't the best. So they'll look here at the ST segment, they'll look over here at the PR segment, see where the PR segment is, and then they think the PR is the baseline or the isoelectric line, when in fact, the PR segment is often depressed um, there's many different causes for PR depression, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is what the pseudo elevation that you might see due to PR depression. So what you should use, if possible, is this TP segment that I drew out here. And that TP segment will provide you a more accurate um, example of what the uh, isoelectric line should be. Okay, So that's your isoelectric line there. And then you would look at your ST segment, either before or after, and kind of draw a straight line and see if you're on the isoelectric line. Obviously, this rhythm below here, you have 2 millimeters of ST elevation, which is significant. Here's a, just a simple diagram showing where your J points are on those same two rhythms. And again, it's important to remember, I've kind of exaggerated what the ST segment looks like here. A lot of times it becomes diffuse and difficult to identify. So when that happens, if you were to looking at a 12 EDKG, you should have uh, you know, a lead either above or below the one that you're you know, finding this diffuse uh, J point on and, and try to identify it on one that's a little bit simpler and then just draw a straight line down and that will tell you where the J point is because the rhythm above and below uh, any lead on 12 EDKG is the same exact uh, rhythm. Those QRS complexes are the same exact QRS complexes. They just have a different angle of view. And of course, we should talk about ST segment morphology because the morphology can uh, lean you more towards an STE mimic versus a uh, STEMI. All of your STE mimics should present with a concave ST elevation. And that's what you see here. If you were to draw a straight line from the J point to the tip of the T wave or the peak of the T wave, the SC segment falls below that with concave. As it flattens out or goes above uh, the that line, then you have what's called convex ST elevation. And the difference here is that concave is usually not bad. All of your ST mimics have it. And convex is always bad in our minds. It doesn't, you know, there are certain circumstances like a left ventricular aneurysm that might present with concave elevation that isn't a STEMI. However, those are going to be very difficult to determine in the field, and we should certainly get a, a cardiac consult at a PCI center to identify that. Without previous 12 EDKGs, it's going to be very difficult. Your concave elevation doesn't mean it's not an MI. Some MIs will still have a concave elevation, and that's why we use things like reciprocal changes uh, in the patient presentation. Remember, great thing about 12 leads is every one of them comes with a patient. So look at your patient, assess your patient, and use the whole clinical picture to make your determination. So that's it for part one on this lecture of uh, STEMI and STE elevated myocardial infarctions involving ischemia, injury, and infarct. If you'd like to go back and review STE mimics, uh, you can click the image on the left here or move on to part two of this discussion on STEMI.